Tom here, Flip Anything USA. Today we're going to look at uh, Jonathan Gray. He's president and COO, uh, the chief operating officer over at Blackstone in their, their real estate division. Sharp guy. Uh, you know, he's made some mistakes in the past. You know, they invested heavily in offices, which was kind of a mistake. We're going to watch him. He's interviewed uh, on uh uh, Bloomberg Wealth with uh, David Rubenstein, and uh, we'll uh, we'll watch this a little bit. And uh, you know they they're they're bullish uh, on the market on the uh, real estate market. And he's going to try to explain why. I haven't seen it yet, but we'll uh, we'll, we'll watch and see what happens. This is Jonathan Gray, you see behind me here. Hey, before we get into this, uh, look, please hit the like button, hit that subscribe button. It, it helps the channel. just takes a second to do. Just hit that button. I've been making money in real estate for 40 years and been real successful at it. One-man show, and uh, I love sharing with you because I think everybody ought to just be a one-man show, no partners. I mean, it's it's just such a wonderful lifestyle. It's, a, it's the fastest way to get rich, and it's the easiest way to get to get rich and not depend on other people, which can often be, un, you know, not dependable. And uh, if you've ever owned a business, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, anyways, so let's get into this. Now, I got hilarious Darius with me. And okay. uh, anyways, <laughs> uh, so Darius, have you watched much of this guy in the past? So I like David uh, Rupert, I can't say his last name. Uh, I watch a bunch of his content. So when I saw John Gray and Blackstone, I know we talk about that a lot. So when I saw it, I was like, oh, I got to tell Tom about this video. Right. Well, Rubenstein, he's all over the place, right? Yes. He's yeah, yeah. He's just yeah, he's a reporter basically. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so let's let's just go ahead and watch this. I may crank the speed up a little bit. I got jujitsu coming here pretty soon. We're going to, so we'll, I'll watch this for a second and then I'll bump them up to about one and a half speeds uh, so we can rip through this a little quicker. I think it's still a pretty good time for real estate. Texas and Florida are well positioned. You should stay away from buggy whip businesses. John Gray went from aspiring journalist to become one of the top real estate investors in the world. When I met my wife in English class, I showed up wearing a suit and tie. Everyone else was in Birkenstocks. Nice outfit, man. Just kidding. <laughs> it was clear I'd made a decision which path I was on. Forgot to eat today. John joined Blackstone in 1992 and was the second employee in its real estate division. I say to my kids all the time, luck is a core competency. But it wasn't all luck. I've had the opportunity to know John and work with John since I think his second day at Blackstone when he had just gotten, you know, out of Penn. While I think to a degree luck is, you know, involved in, in anybody's success, I think with John, it's a gross overstatement. I think it is, it is just simply raw talent. By 2005, John was running Blackstone's real estate unit and spent the next 13 years building it into a behemoth with about $119 billion of assets. I think he has a very unique ability to combine tremendous amount of vision and understanding trends generally ahead of a lot. So one thing about this guy, he's got great resources at his disposal. Uh, you know, they're looking at things on a global basis. Listen, everybody should look somewhat globally. You know, you got to look at interest rates and the things that are happening. But what's trendy and like, you know, the, the mask and the pandemic and stuff like that, how it can affect your business. And it's really damaged offices, home office Things have been trending anyways before that because the, you know, Zoom and these other things that make it a lot easier to work, you know, remotely. Um, but uh, anyways, but yeah, these, so these guys got the best demographics on absolutely everything in every area there is, uh, which is powerful information, but they still make mistakes. So it'll be interesting. And, and just, be, and it looks at we're, most of us, our world consists of the city we're in. Exactly. And you can be in a city that is just flourishing like crazy while the rest of the country is going to shit. It happens all the time. I've been in, I've seen it. Uh, I've been in areas that were not doing well and I was making money in other parts of the country, mm -hmm. a lot of money. And I was taking that money and I was buying up the assets in my own area oh, wow. that were so distressed. And, and then I, likewise, then, you know, those go up and go like crazy. And then you can buy further away if you want to. I tend to keep everything close. I, you, like I, I say all the time, there's always opportunities to buy property. 
you know, within your area, it can be a little tougher. Uh, you know, when everybody's piling in and moving into town and they're paying the top dollar, then everybody's just, you know, hustling is like crazy and it gets a little more competitive, but it's still easy to make money. Uh, you know, I just closed a deal last week that was, you know, 1.6 million uh, and got a very good deal on that. And I've got, you know, a house before that I bought a hundred grand under market and that's only been about, I don't know, six weeks. So those deals still do exist. And let's go ahead and crank him up, move him, speed him up just a little bit. And we'll go to one and a half times speed. Here we go. A lot of other people and conviction. And he turns that conviction, unlike few people I have seen, into very bold, big moves that have generally paid off. What put John on the map was Blackstone's $26 billion deal to buy Hilton on the eve of the financial crisis. So there were a lot of things going really, really wrong. You know, I'd say... John's leadership throughout was what I would describe as sort of a steady hand on the wheel. The Hilton deal ultimately became one of the most successful private equity investments of all time, reaping more than $14 billion in profits and catapulting John to the number two job at Blackstone. John's sort of the natural. He's just got it all. Seems that journalism's loss has become private equity's gain. When you were growing up in the Chicago area, did you say, one day I want to be the greatest real estate investor in the world? No. <laughs> I, I, um, I got here as an accident. I had grown up in suburban Chicago. Uh, I'd never really been to the East Coast uh, prior to going to college. And when I got to college, I decided uh, that I really wanted to be an English major. I wanted to be a journalist, is what I thought. I wrote for the Daily Pennsylvanian. And about a year into school, I realized a bunch of my friends, fraternity brothers, liked business. They were in Wharton. And I owned a few stocks. I liked numbers. So I decided to get a dual degree. And that was really important for me because my senior year in college, I met a young woman who was an English major also. And a few weeks later, I got a job working for a small investment advisory firm. And that was about 30 years ago. And that was Blackstone, and that was my wife, Mindy. So that really set me off. And so I went from Philadelphia, I came to New York, and I started at Blackstone in the private equity area and in the M&A area. And I was mostly running numbers, doing pitch books for clients, and ordering dinner. I had to make sure the associates got their food by 7 o'clock. And about a year into things, the <laughs> real estate market had collapsed. And the visionary founders of Blackstone, Steve Schwarzman and Pete Peterson, said, look, real estate is a place we should go. They found a guy in Chicago, John Schreiber, a terrifically talented investor, and they formed a real estate business, and they had no people. I had been helping them draft the private placement memorandum for the first real estate fund. And they said, you seem like a reasonable person. Do you want to move over and join this group? And I talked to Mindy. I talked <coughs> to my parents. And I came back and said yes. And that's how I ended up in the real estate business. Okay, so what did you all do in the beginning? Did you have money to invest? Because you didn't have a fund, I presume, in real estate. So what did you do for money? We had to raise the money. And we also just did very little deals to begin. So the first deal I worked on was a shopping center in Chesapeake, Virginia, the Great Bridge Shopping Center. It was a $6 million transaction. We borrowed four. So it was a $2 million equity check. And you would have thought I was buying the island of Manhattan. I mean, I, I was down there for three weeks. I met every tenant. I was counting the car traffic. I was learning the business. And it was an amazing experience because I was the chief bottle washer. I was the waiter. I was the maitre d' because we were this tiny little business. And I was learning it firsthand. Okay, so let's talk about two deals that you did eventually that became two of the best-known deals in the history of U.S. real estate, I would say. The first is EOP, built by Sam Zell. Can you explain what that deal was and why it was such a risky deal and why it turned out to be for you a very good deal? I stumbled on the public real estate markets where there were companies that owned real estate that were trading well below where these buildings traded out individually. And then we said there's this new commercial mortgage-backed securities debt, which is much lower cost than leveraged loans and high yield that you typically use in a buyout. And we convinced the banks to let us use that to go buy real estate companies. And beginning in late 03 through 07, I think we did 12 of these deals, where we started buying these big public real estate companies. We used the public CMBS debt. And then in many cases, we would sell off pieces. Think about it as a fruit basket. You'd sell the grapes to the people who wanted to add and the bananas over here. And that's what Equity Office was all about. We bought the biggest collection of office buildings in the United States. And so it was like running a store where on the front end you're taking in the merchandise and the back end you're selling it. And so within 60 days, we ultimately won the auction. We sold almost two thirds of the real estate. We paid down our debt and we ended up owning really great real estate. One thing people don't focus on is we kept assets in California and New York and Boston. Had we kept suburban Chicago and Stanford, Connecticut, it would not have been so good. So at the end of the day, it was a wholesale to retail arbitrage. But the key was what we kept. And then we held it and ultimately tripled investor capital. In the end, it turned out to be a great deal for you. Yes. Right? The people you sold the real estate to, it wasn't so good for them because the real estate market collapsed more or less when you uh, completed the deal. So ultimately, did you ever buy some of that stuff back from the people you sold it to before? We ended up buying some of it back. And a lot of those people are my friends. No one knew at the time the music was going to stop. So let's talk about another deal you did that also turned out to be probably the most profitable buyout of all time. It's real estate related. So really, that just kind of goes to timing again, right? That's, you know, people say, oh, buy the dips, buy the dips. And so it looks like these guys, you know, did a great job. You know, he, he sold the stuff. He, he kept the cream of the crop stuff. That And, and that's, like I say, with, with retail real estate, like they're talking, that's what I buy. I buy retail buildings, centers very similar to what they just showed. And those have been so resilient in general. It, but it, it, like I say, even if you make a mistake and, you know, maybe you have a little bit of a tough time, because they have a decent return, 
they're kind of self-healing, mm-hmm. you know, uh, where like, you know, the office stuff and, you know, and I'm wondering how his Hilton stuff is done. I think they already blew that through that transaction already. But, uh, but anyways, it's, it is always, uh, you know, a wonderful thing, uh, to buy properties that will survive. And e- even though they may go down a little bit, not necessarily in value, maybe in cash flow, mm-hmm. or maybe in value and cash flow, but they're still making money. They kind of they kind of self heal. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm such a big fan of commercial yeah. commercial yeah. real estate and industrial property. Let's keep watching. Uh, right before the market crashed in uh, 07, 08, you bought the entire Hilton Hotel company. What was your thinking about buying Hilton Hotel? Was it a real estate play or a corporate play? I'd say it was a bit of both. Uh, we did the transaction with our real estate private equity funds and our corporate private equity fund because Hilton owned great real estate like the Waldorf Astoria, the Hilton Hawaiian Village, but it also had this amazing management franchise business. And when we bought the company, it was similar to the equity office transaction in that we thought we were able to buy something because of the scale and because it was in the public markets more inexpensively than we could buying these. So in that, that when it said the amazing management franchise, mm-hmm. in other words, they have a, 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 even Trump does this, you can put their name on mm-hmm. on the property yeah. and they'll manage the real estate. They'll manage the hotel. A lot of people don't realize that you can buy a hotel and have nothing to do with the business. It's a, it's a rental. Somebody else is, you know, you, you maybe get a piece of the action. That's sort of what that, that deal, those details can work out however you want. Even, uh, you know, uh, places like, uh, elder care, mm-hmm. you know, like the, the, thir- it's 139 room facility where my mother is right now. And, uh, actually somebody I know, the guy I know, he built that wow. and he built it and then put just like a hotel management company mm-hmm. place. They have, you know, hospitals are the same way. You can put a, you can buy a hospital and put a hospital management. Wow. So in you can place. own the building and hire a management team. To, you just say here, here's put, put a hospital or, you know, and wow. then they take care of everything. Wow. Same with a hotel and same with different, there's a lot of there's several businesses that like that model, but that's interesting. So that, that, but they saw money in the franchise part mm-hmm. of it because they have a management, you know, and so think about all these hotels that close up. They may be totally unscathed, other mm-hmm. than they just had to let go of some employees. Yeah. So, kind of interesting. These assets individually, and we also believe that the multiple was reasonable. We were paying 13 or 14 times cash flow for what we thought was a great business. Our mistake, of course, was that our timing was terrible. We, we closed on a transaction at the end of 07. Uh, in less than a year, of course, Lehman would collapse. The global economy would be melting down. Global travel would decline dramatically. This company's revenues would go down 20%. Um, cash flow would go down 40%. And we marked our largest investment ever as a firm down by 71%. That was not a good feeling. But, but what I would tell you is we believe the decline was cyclical in nature. And so we invested $800 million more at the bottom. We stuck with the company. It started growing. There was a cyclical recovery. We ultimately took it public. We broke it into three different companies, a management franchise, timeshare, and real estate business. And we made $14 billion for our investors. You know, it's funny because I've stayed at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you one of the things that I know that they did is they stopped owning the entire property. And he's probably responsible for doing this. Mm-hmm. What they did is they condoized these uh, you know, vacation resorts. So you, you'd still have a lobby and you'd still have, you know, uh, I didn't think they had room service at this place anymore, but they used to. Uh, so now it went to, these are condos. You can buy the condo and people would rent them out. Wow, In like fact, you, yeah, you go on Craigslist and, uh, or, and then there's some people that did timeshares with mm-hmm. them. They put them in timeshare stuff, but they, they got rid of the, they took the hotel and they either turned it into a giant timeshare setup and or they sold the individual condos out and people could just come there as well. But what happened was the, the quality, in other words, it they no longer had to have a restaurant and room service. Mm. So it really made it kind of yucky. It wasn't that great anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? That makes sense. Yeah. For vacation, it's not so ideal. But it, anyways, but let's keep watching. So it ended well. But when it wasn't looking so good, did you go home to your wife and say, you, you told me to go into real estate and maybe it wasn't such a good thing. You didn't, you didn't uh, say that? You know, it's funny. I, I, in all seriousness, my wife and my children, that, that was really important. As you know, in a period of time when things are stressed, having people you can rely on and talk to and who still believe in you is really important. And, and it was hard because you felt terrible. You felt badly with your colleagues, with your investors, but we never lost faith. And, and really for me, that experience, that searing experience in Hilton was probably the most important thing for me as an investor because what I learned was, we bought at the worst time possible, and we ended up having the most successful deal of all time. And what that said is, we had bought a really great business in what we call a great neighborhood. It had terrific tailwinds, people, global travel's a growth industry, these brands were super valuable. And so what it's led me to think is, too often when we invest capital, we focus on, I'll call it the individual house, not am I in the right sector? Do I have those tailwinds? And in this case, this was a fundamentally great business, and we could afford to have paid too much and do it at the wrong time. 
But ultimately, with the right management team, the right financial support, we made a bunch of money. And that is... See, and that's one of your hedges. And So I like this guy, obviously. What they're doing is the same thing I do. Mm -hmm. I buy under market. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say, if you buy property under market, that's kind of your hedge. Is if things start going down, you can do like my leapfrogging chapter. You can mm -hmm. you can dump it before everybody else. You can sell it for cheaper than everybody else. As it turns down, you still make money, but you get out of the market before it goes even lower. Yeah. And like he said, he did that one time before. It looks like in, in the you know the people that bought it got hurt. Yeah, you know, but he was a seller, and so yeah. he was on the right side of it. And then likewise, he had the option to say, okay, you know what? We like these assets. We're going to go ahead and keep them because he bought them right. They still made money. Mm -hmm. So, anyways. Uh, so far, pretty impressed. Really impacted everything I've done since then. I think the shortage in housing will become more acute, um, and so we continue to like it as a sector to invest in. Yeah, so maybe some of you don't know it, they are investing heavily in individual houses right now. Call it the incredible shrinking office building. As more Americans work from home, demand for office space is plunging. The result? Big investors are putting their money into warehouses, data centers, and studios and other production spaces used for streaming. In January, Blackstone took a majority stake in dozens of warehouses, most of them in California and Seattle. The rise of online shopping has made warehouses and other logistics properties more valuable. Last month, Blackstone bought data center operator QTS Realty Trust for roughly $10 billion. The numbers tell the story. Office space in the U.S. made up 19% of Blackstone's portfolio in 2015. Now it's 4%. Hotels were 23% of the firm's portfolio in 2015. Now, 6%. But logistics properties have surged from 9% in 2017 to 38% now. Let's talk about different, two different types of real estate. There's residential and there's commercial. So is residential less risky or more risky than commercial? Well, if you talk about for sale single family housing, um, there's probably more risk in the sense that um, you're building something and you're selling it and it's a function of the market. If you're talking about rental housing, think about an apartment complex, that tends to be less risky because it's less cyclical. People um, don't give up their apartments when there's some volatility, but nothing like, say, office buildings or hotels. So I would say residential rental res real estate safer, less volatile. And then commercial real estate involves office buildings, warehouses, which has been the biggest theme for us over the last 10 years hotels, shopping centers, senior living facilities, and all of them have different risk returns depending on geography. Another way of looking at real estate are things that are already existing and things to be built. So is it riskier and higher reward to build something or are you in more in the category of trying to buy things that already exist? Uh, we generally are in the business of trying to buy existing real estate at a discount. So look, that's what I do too. I've built, I've developed a couple of properties as well. Mm -hmm. But when you buy existing property, there's so many advantages to that because A, you get a lot more building per the size of the property. Uh, by today's standards, you've got to have so much open grass area and things like this that they didn't used to require. So, you know, and it's done, it's mm -hmm. done. There's no risk. You don't have to sit there with a construction loan and burn, you know, 18 to 24 months building a big building and find out that the market's going down while yeah. you're in the middle of it. Because I've seen, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but even downtown areas, you'll see a building that's in the midst of construction, then the economy goes to pot. It just stops. And then it, uh, it just stops and it looks <laughs> like hell. And pretty soon they're tearing it down. Yeah. So, yeah, let's keep watching. So we bought the Cosmopolitan Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, and we bought it for less than half of what it had been built for uh, because it was built during the financial crisis. So that, to me, is ideal. Occasionally, we'll build things, but in general, we like to try to get into real estate at a lower basis when it's already producing income. The problem with development... See, here's the thing, and this is what I tell everybody. This is like gold. You always want to buy used, meaning already developed, already been. And the reason, like he said, he's buying these properties for less than construction cost. That's what you can do when you buy used. You buy brand new, you, you're paying for everything brand new. Everything costs out of your pocket. Uh, now, it, it, the, the power of buying used is so huge because it has the potential of being sold for under market because it can be sold for under market because somebody's already paid for it. Mm -hmm. So anyways, let's keep watching is it's a bit like saying I'm going to IPO three years from now. When you show up to lease up your building, we could be in a different economic environment, and therefore you may not have tenants, you may not have revenue. So we've generally biased towards existing real estate. Now, as a general rule of thumb, over the last 100, 200,000 years, real estate prices generally go up, values increase generally. But why is it that sometimes real estate developers, you read about them going bankrupt? Is it because of leverage or because the values actually went down? I'd say that the classic sin in real estate is you have long duration assets and people finance them short term. And so for developers who often rely on a lot of leverage, that can get them into trouble. The other thing that could impact real estate particularly today, are changes in technology, the ways we live and work. So if you think about enclosed shopping malls. They Bottom line, demand. Yeah. They were from really the post-war period until a decade ago, the best assets. A large shopping mall anchored by department stores, lots of retailers, food court. They grew value 5% a year, unleveraged 40, 50 years, because they were very hard. They were really fortresses. And what's happened, of course, is 
the internet showed up, e-commerce showed up, and that's really impacted those businesses, and we've seen sharp declines. But that happened over a long period of time. So it can be secular changes in the way we live and work, but the bigger thing, generally, to your point, has been leverage. Some people say that real estate is favorably taxed by the U.S. government. I assume that's because of depreciation and other kinds of things. But now, one of the most favorable uh, parts of the tax code for real estate has been something called a like-kind exchange, known as a 1031 exchange. Uh, the current president, President Biden, has proposed changing that. Will that affect real estate very much or not? I think it'll affect individual investors who own assets for a long time, uh, will harvest gains and then buy a new. So if you don't know it, Biden's talking about eliminating the, uh, the, the, the uh, long-term capital gains. Uh, he wants to tax your, you know, your real estate heavier, uh, and not have, and the problem with that is, is it, it's just going to have people are going to hold their assets and they're not going to sell them and then they're not going to get any tax revenue from it. Uh, but this is a typical mindset of Biden and, and that group that they're just they don't have any brains for business. And that's why so many Democrats right now are even complaining about all the things that he's undoing that were so good. But we'll see piece of real estate. For the institutional investors, it's less of an impact because we're selling, we're paying taxes. What The way it may impact us is if there's less selling as a result. The same thing could happen if capital gains go up. You could see some individual owners of real estate be more reluctant, but I don't think as much of an impact on the institutional market. Let's talk about the geographies for a moment. We're in New York City now. Uh, New York City has seen a lot of people leave during COVID. They're in the Hamptons or wherever they are. Um, do you expect that people will come back, work five days a week, and use all the office space in New York or similar cities that they did before, or is there going to be a need for less office space? When we think about our company, we know we're better together. Our business, we don't have the formula to Coca-Cola. We have a lot of smart, talented people who are connected by culture. And so I think being together matters. Now, yes, I think some companies will conclude they don't need quite as much space, and so that'll create some additional vacancy. People will be concerned about owning office buildings, and that may create an opportunity because there'll be some headwinds for a number of years, and then over time, things will recover. A lot of people have moved to Florida and let's say Texas, maybe for warm weather, maybe because their states don't have income taxes. Um, do you think that trend will continue? And is that a good place to invest in real estate now because more people are moving there? I would say it's a bit of both. I think the, the, the weather, the lower cost of living, lower taxes, particularly in a post-salt world, concerns about quality of life, crime. I, I think the migration has, you know, Texas is one of the fastest growing states in the country, even though. Yeah, and also, uh, uh, listen, Texas is wonderful. It's hotter than hell in the summer, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so the weather is good though, overall for the whole year. It's good. But uh, the same policies, they're starting to institute the same policies all over Texas and the major metropolitan areas that are, you know, at least people leave California to escape all the bullshit, you know, the homeless all over the street. And then they come to Texas and then they vote for all the crap that they just tried to escape. And then they start contaminating and ruining this state. So, uh, don't come. <laughs> don't come. Not don't Just come. Stay. stay away. <laughs> if you're going to vote for that shit, if, you know, don't come. Oh, it's enormous. Uh, um, I think that will continue. And it was accelerated a bit by the pandemic. On the other hand, New York City, San Francisco, these are amazing places. And when you think about technology and innovation, entrepreneurship, immigrants, people are going to come to these cities. You know, my daughter's graduating from college. They want to live here. So I think there will Listen, San Francisco is, is beautiful. It's freezing, but it's, it's actually people think it's so, you know, they say a summer day in San Francisco is like one of the coldest places you can be in California. It's freezing, <laughs> really. I, I bought more $50 sweatshirts there at a liquor store. I go, oh, God damn it, forgot. You know, but anyways, uh, but I can tell you, in large part, San Francisco is an absolute dump absolute dump i remember 30 years ago more than 30 years ago being there and people drugged out laying in the street i'm a woman with her tit hanging out of her shirt i mean it was it was ugly and and it's just gotten worse and you know it's like here free clean needles let's you know you know just it's it's pathetic you know and, and again and then you've got uh, certain groups that take over other cities and they look to San Francisco for guidance which is yeah. like the most piss poor thing there is you know don't forget uh, Kate Steinle Never forget Kate Steinle. She, she deserves way more respect, and, and uh, there should have been justice on that. Never happened. Let's keep watching. There will be a rediscovery of these cities, but I think longer term, the policymakers in these cities can have a big impact. We saw it, obviously, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when these cities suffered. I don't believe that's what's going to happen, and I think with the right policy, I think these cities can really thrive. But yes, Texas and Florida are well positioned. So when you were growing up, and certainly when I was growing up, I'm older than you, uh, people really wanted to own their own house. It was part of the American dream, own your own house. But you've been buying a lot of rental housing now. Is that because you think young adults are not as interested in buying their own home and they want to rent now? No, I mean, there could be some of that. But if you look in the last 
12 months during COVID, there's been a surge in people wanting to own homes. Um, I think our investment, or I know our investment in rental housing is based on the fact that we just haven't built a lot of housing since 08, 09. So we've averaged less than a million homes built in the United States during that period versus probably the million five we need to keep up with population and obsolescence. And so that's created support for single family values, but also rental values. And I think now as the economy reopens here, I think the shortage in housing will become more acute. Um, and so we continue to like it as a sector to invest in. Go where the creative and technology types are, because those are the markets where there'll be the most economic activity. So we're going to stop at that. Uh, in that last statement, you said go to where the technology is, and I think in large part because that's kind of the future, right? Mm -hmm. That's where the jobs are. Um, uh, you know, we we really need. A, I mean, the government can kind of picks the winners on this stuff, but you know, uh, when Biden came in, he canceled all this pipeline jobs that were coming through. Uh, a lot of work that we need is not. Listen, not everybody can go to college. Not everybody's smart enough. Many people read like a sixth grade level uh, and they are lost. They can't, it's too late. They can't go to college and learn shit. They're not going to learn anything that's going to be of any value and because they, they just don't have the capacity. So what what is is better is get into trades and construction and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but everything, it's just, you know, it's like I think this, you know, they got this big stimulus bill, you know, the, like the big one that was for COVID. I think 5% went to COVID. Unbelievable. And now this new one that's for infrastructure. infrastructure I think it's bailout. five to 8% is infrastructure. Yeah. It's 90% pork bailing out stupid debt, laying it all on our kids. It's really uh, a mess. So, but Tate, hey, uh, you know what? I like Jonathan Gray. You can't always follow the lead of somebody big. Uh, they're bigger. They can afford bigger mistakes yeah. uh, where, you know, it'll crush a little guy. But uh, hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, please hit that like and subscribe button. We'll come back. We'll watch more John. Jonathan Gray sometime, and we've got uh, some other guys that are smart guys we're going to check out and look at. But uh, thanks for watching, and uh, please check out the, the mentorship. I've, I've got uh, mentorship, I've got a book, Wake Up and Smell the Real Estate. Be sure to get that. And uh, as well, I've got the mentorship. You can, uh, I've already, I think we've got four, four millionaires, four people that by their own uh, descriptions, they've created more than a million dollars wealth in just one year. And, and that is how fast things can happen. Uh, and so, and many that have made, you know, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands too. So uh, take a look at this and uh, begin, be sure to uh, like and subscribe. We appreciate you watching. Thanks. Okay, you're gonna have to see this because you're not gonna believe it. You can see the uh, cabin in the background. Literally looking at the place right now, we just did a handshake deal on these properties. Tom's class is approachable for literally everyone. I'm an immigrant, broken English. I'm literally, I'm a mechanic. Everyone can do it, everyone. Uh, I made a pretty good amount of money. Uh, when, once I realized that Tom was the real deal, I went ahead and I bought the course. I made over a million dollars in real estate in one year, and I have no cash in investment. I, I'm, I'm on the verge of doing another deal. I'm going to spend 75 and I'm going maybe to 180. We texted back and forth, we call each other, you, you know, he gave me some advice. The support is right there. Not, not somebody else, but he's going to answer. He's going to give you the support. I didn't know anything. So if I can do it in a town of 4,500 people, you can do it anywhere. I don't like to lose. I don't want you to lose a deal. I take it personally if I'm helping you that it gets away from you. It hadn't happened yet, by the way. I had the bank invite me to a board meeting because they're like, how are you finding these deals? We're just very curious how you're putting these deals together, Ron. Four years worth of salary, you know? Wow, wow. Just in one year. <laughs> I gotta get going because he just signed a contract. I gotta go write him a check. <laughs> close the deal, close the deal.